completely destroyed my health. One dreads to think how rich this man will become by the time he leaves Formula One. He just never backs down. Michael Schumacher and his dry pads have to be utterly ruthless about getting parts. I think the crucial thing was not we at war on and off the track. He is very much an individual. He wanted to protect himself. I think he's enormous. What surprised me, and I think he might be more like us. He knew that he's being sick of it, and he was worse. seasons has been um, me and Michael fighting to win the world championship so inevitably um, we're, at, we're at war on and off the track every time we, we thought we'd win whether it was Damon or myself Michael seemed to come through and win so that became a, a bit of a crushing blow towards the end of the season It's difficult for anybody driving next to Michael because he's, he's quick. You know, and uh, you know, somebody so quick, I believe everybody has the same difficulty next to Sam. What surprised me about him right from the get go was his confidence, his personal confidence, bordering on arrogance. It's a very fine line between the two. He was very, very hard. He is an achiever, he's ambitious, he's enormously aggressive, and he is there to win. To know Michael Schumacher uh, personally, it was difficult up to now because I hide of it. I didn't feel free to, to give away uh, what I'm really like. So what you had, you had a professional base, you worked on the racing circuit. That's what the English know. They don't know uh, Michael Schumacher, how he is really. Well, I think my view has changed slightly over the, the last couple of seasons. Um, I used to think that he was a genuinely uh, uh, g a good guy who uh, had, you know, had in his back some sort of code of conduct, some idea that he would conform to a particular code and and not and not do anything devious. But uh, I think that I have to come to the, to the conclusion that the guy is ruthless on the circuit, and uh, he he is prepared to do anything to win and and to prevent anyone else from from beating him. I think that's that's borne out by his actions. Now, he started from third on the grid, the conditions were adverse, he was down to fifth place at one time, but Schumacher clawed his way back and he comes upon Jean Alesi at the chicane, which is a place you wouldn't ever dream of anybody passing somewhere. It was tight, they actually did have slight contact, but if you physically went out in the circuit and looked how narrow that part of the track is, it's virtually impossible for one car to get through there cleanly, let alone two. And with almost unprecedented daring, he just dived in, and all of a sudden, Alessi sees this Benetton alongside him, and had no option but to give way. Alessi Schumacher, Coulthard third, Barrichello fourth, Hill is out, Irvine is fifth, Herbert is sixth, but, and uh, Schumacher has a look! Now, can he get through on the inside? Alessi resists him, he's coming up to a left-hand bend, so he's got the inside line. Last time, what a 
a struggle. This is lap 65. Two laps to go at the end of this one. And Schumacher... Yes! Michael Schumacher takes the lead in the Grand Prix of Europe and the Benetton team go berserk with delight. I think the commitment he showed there and uh, the absolute belief that he would make it round and come out in first place was uh, quite amazing. beat him. I beat him in 92 in the second. The last 12 races in 92 I scored more points than him and I regularly beat him uh, in the race because he's, he's a bit like Senna in that in his computer is not the idea that somebody else can go faster in the same equipment and you, you can rattle his cage and you know exactly when you've done that because he will wander, wander over almost as if he's owning the team, have a look at your time sheets and nod his head and wander off again. At that point I realised that Schumacher is concerned about what you're doing and, and cannot understand why you're doing that lap time. So like anybody he is beatable but you've got to get up pretty early in the morning. Oh you can see the real racers, the people who have, uh, have grown up, you know, developed as a teenager through karting. You can see the ones who instinctively make a move rather than having to actually think about it, they just go. And uh, I think that's one of the differences you see in many of the races between Michael and Damon. Nearly all the drivers in, in Formula One today, and certainly over the last sort of, ten years, started in karting. And I think it's uh, it's absolutely ideal grounding for future Grand Prix drivers. It makes a lot of fun. That's why I still do it. But nevertheless, it's the understanding to compete against uh, other racing drivers to overtake, just to manage your whole race situation. And I've done this many years, therefore I, I had quite a good experience. You come down through this sweeping left-hand corner here, very similar lines that you would take if you are in a Grand Prix car. The only difference is that you would actually slide the tail a lot more under braking before picking up the power. Getting a feel to drive uh, on the limit, what is the limit, how to set up uh, a vehicle, I would say. I mean, a go-kart is uh, it's not a real car, but certainly it has four wheels and it uh, goes around the corners as a Formula One car. Yeah, it's schon vielleicht mal Europameister oder Weltmeister zu werden im Kartsport. very young. I was young too, yes, but uh, for me it looked like he was younger and um, he was a local matador and I came from the from the neighborhood Goka track. For me it's uh, the same impression I have now, the same, very similar, because it was really somebody to to fight against and to somebody very challenging. It's just pure racing and kart racing it's bumper to bumper. You don't have this uh, loss of downforce that you get when you race in Grand Prix cars or, or, or even Formula 3 or below. And uh, I think that's the, the aspect where uh, the drivers really develop and that's the racing ability. I think Estra was a very interesting uh, example of Michael's thinking as a racing driver because we 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 weren't uh, as strong as Williams at Estoril but it was critical we finished and tried to beat Hill so um, the overtaking manoeuvre Michael um, performed on Hill towards the end of the race if you watch the previous two or three laps he was practicing that manoeuvre and he was moving across to the side of the track that he had to use to perform that manoeuvre to clean the track and get used to the performance of the car through that part of the track so he's cleaning it and making sure he could perform the manoeuvre.
it's the kind of knowledge I have and the the confidence, the the way I can prepare over taking maneuvers. Uh, that's I I I learned quite a bit in kart, but to be honest, the most of it I I learned uh, then through the series when I came then into Formula racing and particularly in Mercedes time, because that was uh, a very good school for us. Für Benzin Kontrolllampe, wenn es Benzin ausgeht, geht drüben für Rauchanzeichen. Ja. The first time we we had some more relationship was in the sports car time with the junior Mercedes time. Yeah. In 1990. He never really seeked advice as such. He loves to talk about things and see what people think about it. And then he reflects on it and he sort of makes up his mind then you know he's not seeking advice as such you know he wants to know a few things sometimes but um, that's not conclusive for him then he has to brood on it and think about it and then uh, he comes up with his own conclusions Dekra die Fahrzeugsachverständigen präsentieren die Formel 194 Sein Dankeschön an alle die Einladung zu einer einmaligen Trainingsrunde the sport is massive in terms of its media coverage. It is the largest aggregate television audience of any sport. Ob groß oder klein, Rücksicht im Straßenverkehr will gelernt sein. It's a big world out there and everybody wants a part of, of success and he knows how to achieve success. We have a Schumacher collection and at the moment we're up to 28 million a year selling merchandising, just Michael Schumacher. 300 to 500 million people watch every race 16 times a year. Viel Glück. I know Michael, I believe for the public he look too perfect, you know, sometimes, you know, too, maybe too much perfect, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's not like that, because Michael is uh, outside of the business, he's very normal, he's a very normal guy like anybody else. The marketing value of Michael Schumacher is huge, um, clearly, because, uh, first of all, um, he's a very clean, uh, character, he's very fit, um, he's, he, he's a good personality, so he's an attractive personality to be attached to. Secondly, he's a winner, uh, and companies and brands want to be associated with winners. And thirdly, because he's a winner, uh, people like you are giving him an awful lot more attention than they would pay another driver. What he always wanted to do is do the things perfectly. He has got commitments to sponsors, his commitments to the team, and all this kind of deals he wants to be and play perfectly. So, um, so that is uh, going on the coast of his character, you know, because he, he wants to be good for everything, you know. Monte Carlo is the heart of the world. The best training and what else is going on, see you on Samstag um 19.10 Uhr by RTL. We have the Grand Prix forgotten. The most love was the heart of the world. That is Kölle. Michael Schumacher is unnatural when it comes to appearing on television. I don't know if he's had much coaching or not, but he actually is quite comfortable on TV and he's very effective. I think in having English as a second language has served him well because he speaks very simply. He also has very gentle tones and quite nice gestures, so he's a winning personality on TV. So, jetzt kann ich. Ja. Thema Vize-Weltmeisterschaft hat Michael Schumacher das abgeschrieben. He's extremely warm, he's extremely friendly, he's extremely cheerful, 
He's totally on top of So everything's it. going well for Schumacher, but one thing he has to watch out about is projecting overconfidence, looking a bit too arrogant, a little bit too self-satisfied, and I think he's sliding into that. He could be a little bit more personable with the fans. He talks a lot about winning the races, going, going for it, doing it for the fans. Well, here he doesn't show much uh, interest in these people at all. There's no eye contact, no friendliness. He, he's doing it mainly because the cameras are rolling, and he, he knows that. Thank you. When I first saw he was going to be a great driver was in Suzuka 91, when he'd been a big star in the Jordan already and he'd been driving the Benetton and going extremely well. And finally he had the inevitable big shunt at 130R, very fast left-hand corner at uh, what is a very fast circuit at Suzuka in Japan. And he backed it into the wall gearbox first and quite a lot of damage. And I thought, ah, OK, now we're going to see. You know, He's had his first shake-up. He's just, as we all have done, realised that Formula 1 cars are that bit faster, are that bit heavier, and you're going to you know, have very big accidents. And... Um, I watched quite closely after that, and a little while later he was out in the T-car, and his very first flying lap in the T-car was quicker than any lap he'd done so far that weekend, even uh, before he shunted. So that, that was quite clear. He had the confidence to overcome a big accident to, and just get back straight back on the pace again. And at that point I realised how special he was going to be. It's almost as if um, he can't understand why uh, everyone else can't do it. It's a bit like Jim Clark, who yeah. apparently couldn't understand why no one else could go as quickly. Yeah. But uh, you know, he is very good. particularly going through Beckett's as a very fast right, left, right sequence of corners. And the speed that he carries into the corner, I mean, I stood there thinking, I don't believe what I've seen. He is so fast into the corner. Well, it's, it's nothing sort of extra special. It's just a way that he controls the car almost with a throttle instead of where I think the majority of drivers that I've known, um, someone like Damon, I know David, Gerhard as well, Mika Hakkinen, exactly the same. When they brake, you normally you brake, you change down the gears, and then you might go on and off the throttle. And I think Ayrton was the big, biggest example of that. When he used to be in the middle of a corner, his throttle movement was so quick, and he was always ba -ba 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 on the throttle. Where Michael has this brake in, changing down, then he's constantly on the throttle straight away. Even if every driver was driving a white car with a white helmet, we could still just about see the technique of Michael Schumacher. It wouldn't be easy though, and to get a much better idea, we need to look at data recordings taken from the controls, from the steering, particularly the throttle, and also, of course, the brakes. And we've had a rare opportunity to obtain data from the British Grand Prix qualifying from both Michael Schumacher and Johnny Herbert's car. This blue trace is the throttle. When it's right at the top, it's full throttle and so now we can see the accelerator building up a section of flat out running before then lifting off and then breaking down for the next corner it's important with a formula one car to be progressive with a throttle and so we don't see it just going vertically up we see it progressively increasing and that's particularly important through this corner bridge corner because that is taken at 160 miles an hour and technique is all important to save time Michael Schumacher approaches on full throttle with the blue line at about 160 miles an hour. Eases back and then he progressively increases to be on full throttle on the exit, before then lifting abruptly of course to brake for Priory. Now comparing this with Johnny Herbert's throttle position, we can see that in fact Herbert keeps on full throttle for longer, certainly no lacking in bravery, but then he has a much bigger lift to slow the car down more before slightly raggedly increasing it back to full throttle again. Now looking at the speed trace, the blue line of Michael Schumacher, 
shows his speed increasing all the way up to 160 miles an hour and then in fact it really rather levels off all the way through the corner hovering around the 160 miles an hour point before dropping abruptly away again as he breaks for Priory. Now looking at Herbert's speed trace, he's a little slower out of the previous corner but gradually makes up ground and so he's virtually as fast on the very approach to bridge. But because of that much bigger lift on the throttle, his speed then drops down quite significantly. He's five miles an hour slower in the middle of the corner. Now looking at the steering trace, we can see just how close to the limit the drivers are. On the approach to the corner, the trace is fairly smooth. But then in the middle of the corner, we can see from the zigzag lines just how much correction Schumacher is having to make for tiny slides that can't actually be seen, not obviously anyway, from the outside of the car. Now looking at Johnny Herbert's steering input, on the straight it's much the same, but in the middle of the corner he's not so near the edge and so the trace is smoother. As a result, on this corner alone, Schumacher was two tenths of a second faster than Herbert, and in fact in qualifying over the whole lap beat him by one and a half seconds, or 100 metres at the end of the lap. I think the main ability I have is that I have a good feeling for the limit, a very consistent feeling for the limit and I'm able to run the car um, for almost 100% uh, on the limit and that's probably the, the difference in style where someone has uh, the ability to do that in, in the entry of the corner but not in mid-corner and then the exit again or the other way around and I, I can almost do this uh, all the way around the corner. is very much on the limit when he's driving it and it's quite apparent I think one of the things that stuck in my mind more than anything was in Suzuka when I was following him uh, the end of last year and I could have sworn he was off three or four times and I just said to myself that's it he's gone he's off and he didn't go off he stayed on and that's the uh, the thing that sticks in my mind he has got uh, a tremendous amount of ability obviously but it's this ability also to drive right to the limit for the entire length of the race, which I think makes him, uh, or has resulted in him winning two world championships the way he has. People say he's arrogant, but he is not. He's just a 100% worker. If you want to be successful, you have to be pushing. He's not arrogant on purpose. He only has so much time a day to talk to everybody and the rest of the but I don't believe he grew at least a short time. I would say in all honesty that I have never been able to talk to a Formula One driver who is easier to get on with than she makes. Yes, some have been as easily, but not many. People sometimes tell me, ah, oh, he's very arrogant. But uh, I don't think so is that, you know, he's, uh, he's like that. But uh, the moment he finished the race and uh, you have had a normal time with him outside of the business, it's, it's very normal. With us, he's always been the same. He doesn't... It would be fair to say that the team members wouldn't allow him to change, really. If he arrives at the circuit a bit big-headed, he soon gets knocked down, you know, with some jokes and some banter and... No, exactly, pulling. you do that with Michael Tuna. Well... Once again, you can still, perhaps because of the language gap, you can perhaps say something to him that he probably doesn't realise for a few minutes. <laughs> um, and then by the time he decides to chase after you, you've run off. <laughs> He's not Mr. Iceberg. If you can, if you can get extra motivation on your uh, home ground, this, this uh, shows that you are not a robot, but a, but a human being. And uh, I think uh, this, is, this is very convincing. That uh, that Michael is a is a guy who who needs uh, the success in front of his people, of the very let's say of the of the guys he likes most. I think you you will have it wrong, but um, the point is that up to now. Uh, I'm four and a half years in Formula One, 
I have had uh, certainly a lot of success in a very, very short time. And therefore, there has been a lot of uh, things going on uh, around me, a lot of uh, meetings, press, who all want to know Michael Schumacher. And in Germany, the people know me. I won't, I won't say that uh, around Germany, they all know me. I know that in, uh, in Italy I didn't have a good uh, press, but to be honest, I hardly saw any Italian journalist uh, on the press conference and, and speaking to me because they didn't speak any English. With English is different. Uh, they have been there, but to know Michael Schumacher uh, personally, it was difficult up to now because I hide it. The image is important to anyone who actually is a product of their own career and also if they're on television because that's how they're communicating with the public and their potential sponsors. So if they ignore how they're coming across and don't do anything to improve it, they're shortening their careers, they're shortening their potential future and their earnings. So it really, if you look at the, the impact of how they communicate on television, 55% of the impact comes down to just how they look and how they behave. 38% of the impact is down to the quality of their voice, and only 7% has something to do with what is coming out of their mouth. So 93% of the impact they have on camera depends on their image. This is the best battle of any Grand Prix this year. To have a two-thirds distance, the two arch rivals separated by one to two seconds is absolutely fantastic. And Damon is pushing, pushing, pushing. a great race. It was going to be an exciting race. I thought I saw an opportunity. That I Pretty defensive uh, body language here. First of all, why is he sat down? When you're under fire, you never sit down and look up to the journalists, look up to the cameras. You look uh, pathetic in that position. So he should have stood up and held the eye contact at camera level. And his hand is giving him away. It's trying to cover his mouth. It's almost saying, I don't want the words coming out of my mouth to be heard. Uh, so this is a rather uh, unsuccessful performance, I'd say, for Damon Hill. He came from nowhere, as I got told from my engineers. And I don't see the sense uh, of doing things like this. In Michael's case, it's quite different. He stood up. He's looking straight at the, at the journalist. He's calm and composed. And also, his voice is very gentle here. Uh, his words are very simple, understandable. He looks like a man in charge, much more believable. I mean, it's more or less a situation like in Adelaide where he tried to dive inside where there was no room also. So I uh, had twice uh, an incident like this where it was absolutely unnecessary. And I, I can't understand this, to be honest. It doesn't matter what paperwork says. The fact is that certain people in life will dominate. Certain people in life will come into a team or will have a teammate join them. And all will happen is that the teammate that comes in thinking, I'm going to beat Michael Schumacher because I think I'm as good as him, will soon find out that that isn't the case. It's about personality and character, and that's something that Schumacher has and other drivers of that quality have had. And that is why they are the world champions, and that's why Schumacher will continue and be a world champion in the future. At the beginning of this season, it was always a very difficult a difficult part, especially after Brazil, because when I qualified fourth, I think it was sort of a bit of a shock to, uh, I think, to Michael as well, I think. And I remember even Gerhard saying, he thought, oh, well, you did a good lap there. So it was a surprise to many that I think I got, got to fall fat early, especially after all the problems we'd had. And then it was really when I got to um, the following race in Argentina that then I had a few problems where I wasn't really allowed to look at the data at all. I could look at mine, but I couldn't actually look at his, where on the other side of the table he could look at both and, and work out where maybe I was quicker than him. Well, initially his speed completely destroyed my head, as it were, the pressure of being at Benetton and various other political situations that were bubbling up under the, uh, under the surface and, and his sheer speed and, of course, the attention that he would get uh, in and around the team and from the media was quite off-putting and I had to dig very, very deep to overcome that. When Michael used to phone, I used to phone Flavio and say, I need another day, and Flavio would say, well, yes, Michael, yeah, you can, you can have those days. So I just used to go along to some tests and I'd be there, it was a four-day test, and I'd be there for four days just 
walking about and not actually doing anything. So he, he was frustrating. It was one thing I understood uh, was was sort of going to happen, but I just didn't think it would happen to the scale it did. I don't think we were going to see another right in Senna because I think Senna was exceptional and special. Everyone reflected uh, on their own position in the sport after what happened at Dimola. How close were you to, to thinking that maybe Formula One wasn't for you? Very close. Because racing has always been uh, special to me, it has always been fun to me. I enjoyed it 100% while I was sitting in, in the go-karts or in the other series. You think about accidents, you see accidents, and I've seen heavy accidents, Spa, uh, Alessandro Zanardi, really heavy accident. The guy jumped out next day, I saw him on the circuit. So you get a certain feeling what uh, it's able to happen. I, I had myself an accident, high-speed accident. I was all right. I did race the next day. So you you think if unforeseen things will happen, then okay, you're going to be dead. But I never thought that it actually would happen. And then I got the first time confronted with death in my in the sport I loved, and that changed quite a lot in in inside of me. And racing was uh, a big question mark for me, whether I do it or not. Well, he was always, to put it blunt, uh, one woman man, you know. He sort of, he was never looking around for anybody. And, um, you know, since he's married, it gave him, it seems, a lot of stability. You know, he's very settled. Of course, it all went hand in hand with his two championships and all that, so it's easy to say. But I think, if anything, it did a lot of good for him. By time, you, you can introduce uh, the, the privacy a bit into the sport because you become just more relaxed and more open and more free, more confident, all of that. But he's not a city man, you know, you cannot put him between people. He needs uh, just go back somewhere where he's just by himself and uh, that's what he needs also you know for many days of relaxing just be by himself and, and just to be in the nature <laughs> He has a sometimes a slightly immature sense of humour, as I found out in Australia, with beers down my back and uh, somebody was throwing strawberries at me or something. I think it was him. He, I mean, he, he he can have fun. We all have to let off steam. The pressure that we're under in the job that we do. Uh, I think he's more of a he's a family type of guy. He, he's very close to his family. They're very important to him, and he likes surprisingly some of the simpler things in life for an example when i take my boy sometimes when we go go-karting you know he loves to look after other people's kids and whatever and he he loves to play mechanic you know and he takes engines apart and together and he really enjoys that so he loves very much the mechanical aspect of it Yeah. 
Cheers. Michael, do you want to send a message to the camera? What? Cheers. <laughs> That was probably the one race of the year where Benetton got their strategy not quite right. And Damon drove an outstanding race. I mean, one of the best races I think he's ever driven in his Formula One career. I would say this time um, they caught us out with uh, strategy. I mean, usually we do the other way around, but this time we lost uh, quite sure in, in the strategies, but uh, nevertheless one point in front, looking forward to any late now. Everything to play for, one race, it's terrific, I mean you couldn't have hoped for a more thrilling final race and uh, it's going to be really tough but it's going to be good. And it really did make it very tense going into Australia and uh, I think it's the first time, in fact I'd say it's the only time that Michael has shown some signs of tension. It was very, very difficult going into that last race. Michael recognised that as the year had progressed, the, the difficulties that the Williams team had gone through with Ayrton Senna's accident, and then a car that was not a good car at the start of the year, but evolved and developed and became, in fact, at the end of the 94 season, the quicker and better car. He was gonna to have to do something very special. And again, it was a uh, looking into your own resources and digging deep and, and using as many of those resources as you could. Now admittedly he was in front but he was in front in a situation where Damon Hill had been pressing him very hard snapping at his rear wheels for a long long time and Schumacher was under pressure. Now he lost it. We expected Michael to gradually, after 10 or 12 laps, ease away from Damon, but Damon was stuck there like glue. It is very difficult to drive on the pressure. You know, like, like you have to be world champion, you have to win this race. It's always, and there's a, um, Every driver reacts different on this pressure, and um, and I saw the first time Michael he did this um, this, uh, this this mistake in his career. Having thrown it away seemingly at that particular incident, you could see everybody saw his face, you know what it was like, and then his disappointment, and you know he had to cope with it in that very moment, and he was totally you know overawed by this misfortune in a way and by his own mistake. Damon came round the corner, he hadn't seen what had happened to Michael Schumacher. He suddenly saw himself much closer and he thought, I've got to take the opportunity now, I've got to take the chance as I see it. And uh, as a result of that, Schumacher goes off and he's then standing by the side of the course, expecting Damon Hill to reappear and if he did so and finish the race, Damon Hill was going to be world champion. The indications to me were that he was in trouble, his car was damaged and he must have known that, and that he looked to me like he was moving across to the left and pulling off the track. And uh, I thought, well, he's going to the left, he's, go he's going to bark it up, I'm coming through. Yeah, yeah. That's the judgment a racing driver has to make in fractions of seconds, and I can't blame Damon for making the move he made. He had the lowest point in his career, and next moment the highest point of his career. It was amazing. Well, Damon Hill didn't reappear because his left front suspension was damaged and Michael Schumacher realised that he had become world champion. That was what he had been striving for for all his life in competition and he had got there. I 
think you can't credit the guy with the coolness and the, uh, the ability to think clearly and calculatingly on the circuit during a race and then say to the, and then say, turn around and say he didn't know what he was doing. Um, it is, it's either one way or the other. Either he's instinctive and he, he just does what he does, or he, um, he knows exactly what he's doing. And in that instance, Michael Schumacher walked away with the World Championship and Damon walked away as being the runner-up. If you speak to all the experienced race drivers, they will say, I wouldn't have done anything different. That's what it's racing about. It was my line, I was in front. Damon, Damon saw a chance to take, which I would have seen as well. He dived in, but I uh, didn't see a reason um, to, to go away, especially as I, I didn't really notice him uh, over there until he was uh, already very close to or we hit each other. But uh, if somebody is not clearly in front of you, there's no reason to uh, to open up and go by sight. Uh, otherwise, you you uh, you will call the sport maybe ping pong, which uh, you just uh, have a little bit of fun. That's in this circumstance when you when you fight so tight, and if you look at it, uh, you I have to say you ha can have two opinions about it, which. I, I have some uh, understanding that the English will have a different opinion than the Germans, but uh, that's the way it is. Uh, in the end of the day, if you ask Damon, he will say, uh, I probably would have done the same. It's, it's too easy to get blinded by everything he's done that is right. I mean, he's, again, I have to say, he's good. I mean, he's, prob he's probably the best driver um, for the last uh, two seasons, definitely, to have been on the track. And this year, he has just blown everybody away. He is the complete man. He's certainly the best driver in the world of this generation. Michael Schumacher is first to sixth, and then there's the rest. Then when you are in the podium and you win in the race, you mean you are the best in the world in this moment. Well, there is a rumour that he's a human being. <laughs> and if that's true, <laughs> then he has weaknesses. <laughs>